Cool. Hello, Mark. Uh, so you're here to tell me about how robots are taking over the world. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yes, Kyle. That's exactly what we're doing over here at Energy Robotics. <laughs> So you have a software company that builds um, technology around uh, like external companies' hardware, um, generally for like energy, gas kind of industrial applications, right? Um, how did you guys kind of get started with that? I know you had some other companies before uh, Energy Robotics that you had worked on and, and started before. So how did that kind of come together? Okay, but maybe let's start for what, what we do with Energy Robotics and then tell you how I get there. Uh, so what we do at Energy Robotics is uh, we develop software which runs on the robot as well as the cloud, uh, which therefore allows the robot to uh, operate in an industrial environment and collect data, which we then transform into business critical information. So simply, um, if you have a plant Usually you have humans walking around daily once, twice or three times to check what is the status of the plant. So understand what is the situation. In. And um, what, we, what we do is we, we, instead of having the human running around with pen and paper and note over down, which is a very tedious, partially also tiring and uh, in certain industries a dangerous job, uh, we take out the human and bring a robot in who is then collecting the data. And uh, when I mean uh, making business critical uh, information out of that is um, to transform via computer vision or other AI or also standard algorithm, the, the sensor data into um, an information. Example is uh, having a picture of a manometer and transform the picture of a manometer into, ah, oh, there's a needle. Uh, I can read out uh, the dial and I realize, okay, it's 3.5 bar or it's uh, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, Celsius, uh, all that things what humans would do and then have that completely automated and do be doing that in oil, gas, chemical, power utilities. Uh, we're starting in security surveillance uh, in all those industries where you have right now a shortage actually of humans because of the demographic effect. But that is what, what energy robotic does. Awesome. And Okay. Um, yeah. And when I how do I get there? Uh, quite simple. Um, I was um, um, always in robotics. I was always a tech guy. Um, uh, when I was a kid, I dreamed of uh, robots and I built uh, some robots when I was very, very uh, early on. And then when I studied computer science, I joined a, a team of uh, students which uh, were playing RoboCup. And RoboCup is the thing where you have robots putting on a, on a soccer field, and then they need to play soccer against each other, uh, fully autonomous. And uh, that went into a, a very successful career into being a world champion, twice actually. Uh, and there I got to connect it with, uh, with some of my co-founders. Uh, and now I'm, I'm, I'm the guy in the team who has, uh, let's say, the least amount of uh, academic titles as well as the least amount of uh, world champion titles because everyone else has more. It's like, <laughs> hey, how many world champion titles do you have? Uh, seven or eight? I stopped counting. It's like, yeah, okay, thanks, got it. <laughs> That's interesting. So when you're building robots for this, like the World Cup soccer, how, what is like the biggest, I guess, challenge in that um, robotics wise yeah i think that's the, the, the robocop is like it was actually early an idea how to motivate people to be in that field to do, sure. do autonomous robotics and the other part was also to make sure that it's uh, it has a real world application and you think okay soccer is not yeah mm -hmm. of course there's some fun but fun stuff was and it still is is uh, that you find many many issues what the robot has or challenges what a robot has uh, uh, to operate with humans is uh, you can you, you see it in football right or soccer so uh, where am i where's where's the ball uh, where are my opponents where are my teammates uh, how I can pass on something, how I can develop a strategy together. Uh, I, there's certain rules and there's uh, I need to behave based on that. Um, then all the locomotion, how to get there, how to pull something. So that there's a lot of problems in there. And if you solve that, you're getting, let's say, improvement in there. And uh, we did that all on the software side. So we all had back then the, the 
Sony Ibos. That is this kind of little robot which you could buy, uh, uh, which uh, then put on the field, and it's like four against four, and ten minutes uh, first half, ten minutes second half, and the challenge here was purely on the software side, right? To focus on how you can compete on the software because everybody had the same hardware, which leveled the playing field. Um, that's uh, let's say the, 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 that was one part, and then. The, let's say the, the, the challenging part was actually scaling it, right? We had up to 60 mm -hmm. people at the end, which are working in the German team, contributing, putting code in there. Uh, how, do you, how do you optimize all this stuff? How do you get that all together so that at the day when you're playing to the world finals, everything works perfect, right? So that was one of the biggest challenges. Interesting. Um, cool. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, so I'm a software engineer at Amazon. I have like similar kind of things where probably one of the most challenging parts of the job, even beyond um, like actually building complex systems is literally just integration between people's um, code and the different parts of the system and stuff. So um, it's interesting that that would also be the, like the most challenging part of the robotic side of it too. Um, <laughs> so how have you seen like, cause you said you guys focus on like building the software. How have you seen, like the development of hardware over the past couple of years and kind of looking forward a little bit, yeah. how has the hardware developments shaped um, like your company? And like, do you see limitations with that? Um, would you say like the software is kind of ahead of the hardware or do you think that the hardware is kind of ahead of the software right now? Yeah, it's a kind of chicken egg question, right? So uh, and, um, if you look at um, robotics, we, we always need to separate between robotics 1.0 and 2.0 more or less uh, because 1.0 are all those which are building our cars right the robot arms doing something which is a different task of of what we're looking right now now we're looking into mobile autonomous robots uh drones which are let's say uh, uh, uh mostly operate in an environment which will build for humans if you go in a car manufacturer if you go to you know, i mean in germany so you go to bmw just like that's everything built for the for those industry robots 1.0 so that they can do their job right um but now we, we're switching and we have those robots in our environment that means that they have completely different uh requirements on the behavior on the hardware capabilities and on the software side and uh coming back to your question then the the the, the, the there's always a kind of chicken egg thing right you have you need to be good at the software side, but obviously the hardware always needs to be available to test your new software. So if you don't have hardware available for really developing your software, you're not progressing. That was all the same uh, when you're looking back in RoboCup, right? So you needed to have a, 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 let's say a vast amount of hardware just to be available, uh, to be used by someone who said, I want to develop this right now. And that could also be conflicting if some, somebody blocked the hardware right now uh, for doing something else. So that's why it will be, it's always important to have more hardware available and uh, have it also up and running um, to, to move along in the software side. Mm -hmm. so, so as, um, as your industry, I guess, develops more and industry moves towards like robotics and automation, do you think we're going to see more adaptation of like industrial sites to be kind of um, like for robotics and kind of like built around that concept rather than, yeah. cause I know right now, right. You're kind of trying to automate human processes and you're trying to get like robots to be able to interact in an environment that humans normally interact in as this develops further. Do you think that's going to shift towards just being built like without the humans in mind? Um, like I know yeah. for, for Amazon, for example, we have uh, like specific like warehouses and sites that are built kind of around uh, Amazon robotics. And we have literally like half of the processes that normally would be structured one way or kind of reconfigured completely just to have the, the autonomous yeah. uh, robots kind of handle it. Yeah, yeah. I think that you will, you will see that more and more that you have uh, robots only environment. Yeah. Um, especially if you think about the warehouse, Warehouses are for ages already automated to a high degree and getting more and more. And it's it's an environment where, let's say, it is still friendly for humans, but it's not made that humans are operate every day in there. It's more like, okay, maintaining and getting that machine running. And uh, that kind of uh, a warehouse is then in itself actually a big machine when you 
put that all together, right? You have those uh, conveyor belts, you have the machines, the robots which are taking in uh, the stuff, and then there's the other one which is getting it out. So th th that is, this is just getting a big machine. But if you are environments where, where you constantly also have changes, then you probably will not have that kind of super optimization of a, of a, of a robot environment. And it will be, mm -hmm. okay, I need to be able to change something. So when we see that in, uh, for example, in oil and gas environment, yeah, they try now to build the new plants uh, fully autonomous, which means there's no human or there should be no human usually around. Uh, but obviously, if you want to change something and you will do that, because uh, even if you think that the thing is built for once and nobody touched, our experience is there's always something needs to be repaired. Something has changed, something is optimized. So you need to always count in the human to do changes in there. As long as you don't have the the uh, the let's say the the robot itself, which can do everything what a human can do, but uh, there we are. I think for the next twenty years, I don't believe that we will be there uh, to that price point, which is interesting, right? Uh, because that's always the trade off, right? Mm -hmm. So what's what's like the biggest challenge in designing like the software to handle those environments that are built more for humans than robots? Well, first, there are humans, so you always need to be aware of that. Uh, so having a machine um, operating in that environment, which could be dangerous for human, you don't want to have that. But because the, the, the highest right. priority everywhere is uh, human safety, right? Especially go oil and gas. I mean, if you, uh, if you, if, for example, many of those companies, if you just go upstairs, you always need to have one hand on the stairwell, right? Uh, if you're not, you get really in trouble. So it's, it's really about safety, right? Not only because of the humans, mm -hmm. but also of the environment. So th that means that the robot itself needs to be very safe to operate. Um, it needs to be safe for the humans and obviously for the plant as well. And um, um, right now, when we're looking, in, especially in oil and gas, right, they, they started building those stuff in the 30s, even earlier, partially, right? And there's still plants operating which are 60 years or 70 years old. So the standards have also changed. So you find stairs which are very steep, which you will never build again um, because it's not safe anymore. And you find environments which are already moved to a very high standard of safety for human workers. But when you now add robots, you need to think about what, what happens if a human and a robot meet on a stair. So who has priority of pathway? Um, who, what, what happens in an emergency situation, right? There's a fire, everybody needs to evacuate. How, how do you cope with that? So these are the questions which currently are in process of the planning for the next generation of plants. And uh, obviously that will be much more robot friendly but as well has still had that major impact of, well, I need to send humans in because they built and operate that stiff, uh, stuff at the end. Sure. So in the next like decade or two, kind of how, how much do you see robotics reducing the need for humans on site? If you had to just kind of pinpoint a guess of, of like a number. Well, we, we have some customers which are pointing out that the end, by the end of the decades, they want to have uh, complete operated offshore plants uh, without any human there. Uh, there are already some of them which are existing, but not large sites. Uh, and their plan is really to remove those humans over there. So it's it's not something which is, um, let's say, a dream, um, which happens somewhere. No, it's 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 in action. they executing on that right now. Um, and... Uh, that will be more and more. So, uh, if you if you just think about how many, uh, I, I'm I'm not quite sure if I have the right English term for that, but uh, we call it in German um, that you have uh, some energy heating entities which are sitting in in uh, um, in rural areas, uh, which are then who are supporting the houses around them, which are completely autonomous, right? They're working there, and then someone in three months just checks uh, all the stuff. 20 years ago, this would not be possible, right? Because the machines are not at that level, etc. But we already on on a very high level where we have uh, literally huge machine systems plants uh, operating autonomously. Okay, and then this is like, so I, I guess there's one argument or maybe like an uneducated sort of perspective, if you will, of like automation kind of takes away jobs and, and messes up the economy and, and that kind of stuff. So I guess, what would your response be to that? Like, how, do, how can you help people understand that? Like, that's not the mm -hmm. case 
and that it's actually like a positive effect, like net benefit yeah. for for the economy. Yeah. I mean, um, if you if you look at um, the robotics 1.0 statistic, right? And uh, I had that uh, that graph which shows the uh, employment uh, rate of humans and the amount of robots being used and installed. And every time the employment rate is 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 very high, also the amount of robots goes up, and it doesn't have any impact on the employment rate. So um, robots are just another tool, like a hammer, which we are all in the past, which therefore push us to a new way of doing things more effective. Uh, um, and uh, we've seen that in, in all mankind, uh, let's say history, that a new technology comes up that needs to be that certain stuff is not happening anymore. For example, we in Germany, we have that big coal mine shift. So we, we have uh, reducing our coal um, uh, energy uh, uh, production uh, uh, drastically. And that means that all the people which are working in that industry will not be employed soon. Yeah? Um, but that's the reality of we we'll need to shift to new uh, energy source, which are CO2 neutral. So that will happen, obviously, for an individual. But in the, in the bigger uh, uh, scheme, um, there will be just more jobs coming out of that. And in our example, we can see that that um, right now, those people which are doing the operator rounds, which we are, are in that, let's say, dangerous environment out there with the weather, rain, uh, uh, snow, uh, even hail or whatever, they need to check on the plant, right? So this is now taken up by a robot. And usually those people which are doing that are the most experienced guys, right? So, I mean older guys which are now which is a pain for them to go out there in on those weather conditions uh which are now doing that uh in in let's say in the safety of an operator central where they're looking at the robots doing the stuff and monitoring those robots uh which mm -hmm. means just a shift of okay hey we we we, we somehow capture uh their experience uh and ex, uh, let's say and um, extend the range of their capabilities by a new tool which is is a robot in this case right um, right, and we see that everywhere. Uh, and uh, there's also an important thing: is, is um, we are getting less and less humans because of demographic shift. So um, I can iterate Germany, for example, for four decades or five decades already, we have a, um, a birth rate per woman of 1.4 children. But you need to at least 2.1 to uh, children per uh, per per women uh, because otherwise you're declining in the number of population. That's exactly what's happening now um, in Germany right now. There's um, this year in 2023, um, 1.145 million people are going to retire, but only 700 so up to 800,000 people are joining the job market. So we have a big gap. And that gets bigger and bigger because the biggest generation is the baby boomer generation, which is now started to go to, to, to be retired. And that's true for whole Europe as well as the US. So we don't take jobs right. away. We just need to make live with less people. So how do you how do you see that demographic shift affecting things like more generally? Like, do you think that our technology can kind of keep up with that and that we're going to find some new normal? Or do you think this is something that culturally is going to have to change? Like, absolutely. Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's absolutely have to change, right? Um, because that means also in how our daily social life will be, right? Um, if, if you if you want to make a big bet on, on um, uh, uh, what is it called? Um, uh, here you buy houses or uh, invest in uh, uh, missing the real English estate. term here real estate thank you real estate then uh, invest in uh, retirement homes because there will be a lot yeah there will be so much <laughs> more all people then they need to be taken care of it's just a matter of fact and on the other side there will be less and less uh, 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 childcare in, um, um, institutions because there's just less people just less humans and uh, less uh, kids so that will all across whatever we do in in a society in uh, um, in, the, in the daily life will change how we operate, and we need to live with there will be less people. Uh, I mean, do you think that potentially like globalization and development of third world countries will compensate for that, and that even if even if we don't see a higher birth rate in like our countries, that mm -hmm. like those 
developing countries will kind of fill in the gaps there. And, and as like industrialization happens there, like it won't be such an issue and we'll just have to rely more on like immigration and like education and that kind of stuff. So you, you have that immediate short term problem, uh, which is for the next 10 years, at least, right? Uh, we are mm -hmm. refacing now this critical number. The number of people will just go down. And probably that will also push also on the politics side to, to move and change their, their uh, policies for immigration, for example. Um, but if, if you look at, uh, at the sheer, let's say, mass of that uh, problem, um, China, let's take China. China is an amazing example of uh, how it, this can fail. Yeah? Right. Yeah. So we have uh, right now it's about 1.4 billion Chinese uh, um, in China, right? And because of their one-child politic, uh, their demographic uh, uh, schema is really twisted. And um, they need to migrate 500 million people until 20, uh, in the 21st, uh, 2100, um, or they will decline. And that means every third house will be empty. That's it's just imagine you, you, you walk through your neighborhood and every third will be, because they are 1.4 million right now. And if they're not migrate 500 million people, they will be decline a little bit below 1 billion. And uh, now you can ask for a society, is a society capable for the next 70 years to have migrate so many people in? Uh, what culture impact does it mean? And uh, especially for China, which is not really good on this, uh, this will be a, a tough job to do. Europe is already a migration or migrated for centuries, more or less. The question is, can we also live with that? And uh, if you see, we look to Africa, for example, Niger, Niger I think that's the right term in English. Niger. Uh, Nigeria. Nigeria, right? They have, a, they, they have an amazing demographic pyramid, right? It's like, I, I forget the exact number. It's like one quarter of their whole population is under 10 or something like that, uh, under 10 years. So there's a massive amount of people coming up, which are also then uh, um, uh, um, bring up the next generation. So there's, they are really growing massively over the next years. And obviously they will also spread out over the world. But can Germany or Europe live with uh, such an impact on the migration? Looking back just a few years when Syria war was happening and we had this big wave of uh, 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 people coming up from, from Syria. Uh, I would say we did a good effort or we tried to do our best effort to get those people in and to absorb them. But looking back, how we did that, I think we we need to get much better on this to really get those people much more quicker, uh, let's say, absorbed by society, get them to job, get them to be part of the culture. That's, that's a massive effort. And it's, and let's say, as older you are, it's it's even much more harder for, let's say, adopt sure, to the sure. new world, right? So, I don't know. So, I guess I'm curious. So, I, I'm not super well versed in, like, the historic trends, but um, do you, how much of this decline in, in these issues do you think is stemming from, like, social media and, and tech, like, those kinds of technologies that kind of, like, isolate us and maybe shift sort of the culture um, of things versus do you think it's just generally industrialized societies tend to reproduce less? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's social media is not because it's already happening since the 70s, right? So social media is okay. something which the last 10 years, right? And now there was um, since, um, since, since many, many decades already, and you looked at it's a trend in every industrial civilization that you tend to have less children. Um, um, and there are many effects on this, and uh, you can argue on one or the other. Uh, but obviously, since uh, both parents are working, uh, because you need to have that income to um, to be, yeah to be self sustainable as a family, uh, you're getting quickly to the point that uh, every additional children or kid you add on your household is a, a major impact on your um, wealth. So there's a calculation right. saying it costs uh, if you, a, a child in Germany costs you somewhere between one hundred eighty thousand to two hundred fifty thousand until it reach uh, uh, its own self sustainability. So age of twenty five and then goes up and have a job, right? So that's a lot of money you need to spend. You need to bring up, especially when you're young, 
you don't have so much money for all those kids, children. So therefore, families with three are already rich or are really suffering from having three kids. Right, right. You know? Well, it's interesting to think about too, because like historically, right, and it's probably why we do see this trend. But if you look at like societies that with the less technology and less development, having more children is literally like imperative to having helping hands in the family and things like that. So it isn't, it's interesting seeing how the kind of incentives change and the quality of life tends to go down, I would say in the U S and most developed nations, right. As you get too popular, too high of a population density a along with like you continue having kids, it, it makes it tough. Uh, well, like you said it strains financially. Financially, yeah, but you need to look from 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 all the different angle. So if you go back just one hundred years or something like that, uh, the probability that you die because of war was very high. So uh, that you are dying because of any disease. So the quality of life is so much higher now. But it means also that you don't need to make so many kids because the probability that they are uh, not dying is also much higher. So th that's the trade-off of that. You, you don't need to have so many kids anymore to um, for yourself, for your family, right, for right. making your own wealth. But for society itself, we don't have a proper plan on that. Uh, as I said, now the demographic effects hitting us and everybody says, hey, we need to be more attractive for, for uh, young people to work with us. And the answer is, well, there's no young people who want to work with you because there's just not enough there for everyone, right? So uh, from the employer perspective, uh, um, we need to think how to automate and digitalize because we just need to live with less people. That's the answer. Right. So I guess to take it back to more the robotics side, I, I did have another question. So how do you see... Um, government regulation fitting into the picture of all this automation uh like do you see that as things are ramping up in industry governments able to sort of regulate along the way or or, or do you think that government's kind of falling behind just due to the exponential nature of, of the technological development um like specifically a good examples like the social media stuff right and and how is it like a, a social, is it a utility or is it just a technology? It's a private company. So then there's the question of like censorship and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I'm just curious from like more of the industrial side and robotics side, do you also see that paradigm of government can't really keep up? Um, or, or do you think that that's not as much of an issue? Well, it's a, um, it's a very complicated question and I think there's no easy answer to that, but um uh, t t picking up your social media example, right? So it's also kind of cultural way how to cope with it. So for example, in Europe, we have a very clear, strong idea how you, what you can say on social media, what is hate speech, what's not. And it's, it's much more easier for us to draw the line. Um, US culture, for example, is more open, right? Saying, okay, you can do whatever as long as nobody complains, more or less. Um, and uh, that gives a different set of regulation. And also it brings the fight of what is allowed and what not to a different level, right? So the one is you can do it on, on the governmental and politics level, or the other one is you can have it um, in the daily life, like you see that on, on the, the Twitter uh, fights and all the stuff, right? Mm -hmm. In robotics and AI, what we see now is that say, obviously, as, especially the, 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 the politic has learned and uh, the European Union come up now with an AI act which is exactly trying to regulate and saying, where do you can use AI? What requirements do you need to have in that space uh, to operate with AI? And how do you, uh, let's say, control it and uh, um, uh, protect the rights of humans? Uh, and that's very interesting because it's uh, very, uh, let's say, very early on. And it's, I think it's super important to have that um, to bring down those, those regulations, for example, um, you will be not allowed, I think, so, not 100% sure, but I think it's, it's not allowed to use AI for uh, application processes uh, when you apply for a job. Um, and uh, we have seen already that uh, that could be terrible wrong, right? So it can be very racist and, and, and whatever, because the AI was trained in, in a certain way. So therefore, they, they, they said you can't use it there. Um, uh, and social scoring or something like that is also not allowed. But when you talk about robotics in our field, 
then it goes into critical infrastructure and there's a certain rules which saying, okay, hey, if you want to deploy robotics and AI in that field, you need to have um, another body overlooking that and doing ensuring certain safety regulations, uh, etc. And I think that's that's a, a very good uh, idea to come up with, uh, uh, let's say, guidelines and guide rules uh, very early on before it is impacting our so, uh, society. And uh, AI is super disruptive. We know that. Um, and uh, therefore, it makes sense to start early on. And I'm, uh, I'm there very aligned with, with, with Elon Musk, who from years saying that AI might be uh, is one of the biggest threat for humanity. And uh, yeah, we need to make sure that uh, we understand that uh, and that right. we early and bring this guiding uh, rules. So how do you see like the, the newer developments of like AI and like chat GPT and all that yeah. kind of stuff? How do you see that <laughs> influencing uh, your industry and what you do? Um. Well, what we what we see is that um, when you really want to have robots being um, as useful as possible, you need to give them more and more, let's say, AI technology to um, quickly integrate them into the things they, they should do. I give you an example. So we have wonderful computer vision models, which are, allows us to read manometers, switches, valves, and uh, understand what there's a puddle hole or whatever. But if you go into one of those typical plants, and uh, those plants uh, have a size of, let's say, simply speaking, of one hundred thousand points of interest, you really like to monitor every month in in a, in a continuous uh, repetition. If you don't teach every point of interest to the robot, then it cannot check it, yeah, because it let's say distinctly need to know. I need to look at this and I need to understand this is a valve. Okay, I run a, a valve skill. Uh, we call it skill, which is a detector which says it's open, close, and I can send back that information. Just imagine how much time it will take to teach in one hundred thousand points of interest and keep that up to date because it's, it's so a you living think plant. The biggest challenge is the sheer like size of the data set basically the training data things like that yeah, um, it's, a, it's a bit a little bit more of, of making heads and tails out of it right so what what okay. a human would do is uh, if you send a human in there and uh, they will look at the stuff and see ah oh, look there's uh, that's what i need to check and ah oh, there's a flange which is not on, on my list uh, but uh, there's a flange which is tripping so i need to report that so you have an intuitive understanding what is a burst pipe or something like extreme, right? There's, there's fluid coming out. Uh, right now, a robot would just pass on it because it, well, it is, <laughs> it's not in its, in its mindset. So what you need to do mm -hmm. is you need to train an AI to really understand the difference and also the severity of things uh, and uh, therefore uh, helps to be really intuitive and productive in that environment. So therefore, the... The, the capability of what the robot needs to do be done is, is much more bigger than just taking single points of sensor measurements, right? Um, Energy Robotics just received an uh, European Innovation Council funding exactly for that. And it's called uh, semantic understanding in a, a wider way, right? You send in a robot and the robot is then making heads and tails of its environment and therefore mm -hmm. ensures that you don't need to teach everything but the road come up with significant things and saying something is wrong over there or something you need to look at this, right? So, um, uh, and therefore make it much more easier for the robot to adapt to change in the environment, to adapt to new, uh, to new plans, to new operations, uh, and that makes it a much more useful tool. Do you think that the progression from the industrial side and critical infrastructure side is gonna be uh, like before or after like general AI being more integrated with like other industries and like the, the kind of chat GPTs and like Google alternatives, I think it's called BART or something. Mm. Um, but, but all of that kind of adoption, do you think that's going to go first or do you think the more infrastructure industry side would? 
though you said something interesting you said general ai do you mean a general ai really or do you mean ai in general <laughs> ai in general i guess okay, okay. more what i meant the general ai uh, is probably a little bit further out than anything <laughs> anything else exactly that was for the listeners yeah. so the general ai means something it's a human level intelligence right right now we have right, very right, right. limited ais which can do one thing very good and that's where they are operating and still the question out there if it is even possible to build a general ai but um, here we go um, so will be the um, uh, let's say the development faster than what we see in uh, in, in 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 operations or let's say in uh, in the industry yeah clear you know uh, they, they will adapt what it makes sense but i don't believe that this industry or the industry will bear the let's say the the new ai models or something like that they're more like a consumer of ai technology not so much as a uh, leading edge developer in that or researcher in that industry, uh, in that sense. That's interesting because I feel like a lot of technologies, at least historically through like the industrial age, kind of it's flipped, right? Like a lot of the technologies kind of start in industry and then kind of trickle back into like the more consumer side. Oh yeah, um, you mean okay? That, that, that's different. So, so here's the thing. So um, the industry will definitely be a driver because they're investing and in buying the stuff, and therefore it gets large scale bigger. And then it might trickle back to the rest because then it's from the price point. Uh, the price point mm -hmm. goes down, and therefore it's more affordable for uh, B two C, for example, for uh, business to consumer. So we see that also right. in robotics, robotics hardware. If you just look at the price point of a robot, uh, a walking robot is, is, is a really good one. It's beyond one hundred thousand uh, US dollar, right? Uh, but you see already a cheaper one coming out, uh, which are in the price point of tens of thousands or even ten thousand uh, US dollars, and um, that is a typical, uh, let's say, price. Uh, a degression. What we have seen also with mobile phones. Yeah, just imagine when the first first smartphone came out, how how expensive it was, and now uh, it's a very very cheap thing. But it's just a question of how many uh, users you have, how many consumers you have, and uh, obviously uh, the business, the B two B industry, um, uh, is is uh, is a driver here because it uh, puts money in to solve their problems, uh, but it gets cheaper over time mm -hmm. and faster yeah, than we think. I think Right, right. I think some of my, my favorite examples of that kind of like optimization and market optimization would be like with like cars, for example. Um, so I'm a big car guy, but just like thinking about some of the cars that are available now, just like Mustangs or like Corvettes or even like, like the kind of the like base level sports cars now, like if you look back 20 years, right, they they have more horsepower, better handling, like like it's literally like you couldn't even imagine that being offered to a consumer under you know a couple hundred thousand dollars and now it's just like ridiculously affordable in in a relative sense um, yeah but but yeah i mean definitely like you see that kind of across industries i'm sure ai will be like similar in that sense well but the, the benefit of ai is you don't need to have large investments i mean every every guy behind a laptop with internet access can more or less build a large AI model uh, with a, a ridiculous low amount of money to spend in, right? Um, so that's, that's, that's the benefit of digital in, digital out. Uh, you don't need to have much, right? Um, sure. th that will also scaling is Scaling is so much cheaper too, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. From looking forward, I guess, from your business's perspective, what are the, the biggest, newest like innovations that you guys are working on the sort of you, you had mentioned a, a handful of processes like the inspections and kind of like temperature, like taking temperatures at certain points and that kind of stuff. Like, what would you say is the, the, the newest stuff that you guys are working on that you're mo most excited about? Well, I think there's um, the, the one which I mentioned already, which uh, means uh, the semantic understanding because it's, it's just okay, okay. It's gained so many good, let's say um, it's enabled so much more um, also to adapt to new industry, to be quicker in that market, to really be useful very fast. That's uh, that's an amazing tool. And I think that the, the next bigger thing, what is also on the roadmap for, for this year is um, to think about a more like a fleet or a swarm technology so that you don't think on a single robot anymore doing a job. It's more like you have robots 
and you ask those robots, those autonomous workers to do a certain amount of jobs and they start planning and optimizing that by themselves, right? So for example, you have a drone and a walking and a driving robot, obviously you send the drone up there where it looks at things which, uh, all, which need to be fly or capable of flying. Uh, other ones where you need to have stairs, you take the walking robot. So all that optimize and based on what is available because battery is low or oh, one robot is maintenance uh, and can't be used. So, so you need to uh, then think about an, an, let's say a collective intelligence, which then gets you uh, the results you're looking as a human. And we are not in, in let's say we're not in the business in operating single robots. We are in the business already in operating fleets of robots. Um, and collecting the, the needed information for our customers, right? Um, even, I mean, we were ask, always ask, hey, what's, what's your, uh, is, does this robot have a name? Yeah, that's 805 and that's 803. <laughs> so, it's, it's, a, it's a tool and uh, we need to be very, very, uh, let's say, aware of that, that it, it is a tool. It's not, it's not a human or an animal or anything which is living. How much of your business is focused more on sort of assessing situations and inspecting and that kind of stuff and measuring versus like actually like taking actions like in the physical environment? Uh, 100%. So right now, uh, none of our robots is, is actually um, uh, operating autonomously any, uh, do any changes, right? Uh, I think that it, it will take a while to have that. First of all, you need to have the capabilities, means you need to have arms on the robot. Yes, there are mm -hmm. um, some robots are out there, but hey, that is really early stage. Um, do you trust already the robots so far that you also give them the, the job to do things autonomously? And you always need to take that into consideration that uh, sometimes uh, if you have an, uh, a job to do, it's not just switching one button or something like that. It might be a combination of things. And then you get immediately into the situation where you're saying, okay, how much autonomy do you want to have for the robot? So it needs to do three things, switch a button, turn a valve here, and uh, I don't know, uh, 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 open another valve. Um, what happens if in the middle of the that things, the robot runs out of battery? Then you might have an unstable situation in your plant, right? Because the valve is open, but the other one is not closed, right? <clears throat> so th these are the things which where we are uh, uh, very early on. And I rather say that will take a while until we get there, while in my terms means two to three years. Two to three years, okay. Um, and you see, like, do you think you guys would move in that direction once that hardware kind of catches up? You, no, you it's, 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 it's not only of the hardware, it's also of the software capabilities, network capabilities, mm -hmm. uh, uh, processes around that. Uh, what we see that, I mean, uh, we deployed already over 50 robots, which are in permanent operations. Um, and those robots are living in the outside world, which is uh, not structured in the warehouse. Warehouse is very predictive, right? There's no human can enter or when they enter, they are trained. Uh, we're living not only there's humans, but we're living with weather conditions. Uh, there's snow, there's rain, there's hail, there's air, everything is out there. Um, and that makes it already very challenging. Yeah, And... Um, Having the processes around to operate those robots is, is a much bigger topic, right? There are people need to do oversight. You need to do maintenance and repair on those robots. Uh, you need to uh, ensure that the robots are uh, allowed to enter certain areas. That needs to work with the processes, which uh, says, okay, we can only send the robot in when there's no human, for example. Um, there's uh, a lot about, okay, how do I finance those robots? Yeah, because I have... I want to go for 100 robots. So what does it mean for my company? What's the price per hour? All that, these are the, the let's say, the topics which are run around robotics um, to really operate them efficiently in those environments. Uh, these are a lot of topics which need to be solved, which are away from the pure hardware already. Mm -hmm. And you guys, so are you planning on like continuing to kind of focus and go deeper into like oil and gas and energy? Or are you looking to sort of expand use cases and move towards maybe like warehouse settings or things where where maybe some of those variables are more predictable like do you think that with your technologies you'd be able to maybe accomplish like more or, or a higher level of automation faster that way mm, no so we our our um 
let's say, mission is to be in those environments where we have dull, dirty, okay. and dangerous jobs. Um, that's that's where we believe we, we can create impact. And uh, we obviously go in other industries. So we are right now oil, gas, chemical, uh, power utilities, uh, substations, power plants. Um, we now looking into security surveillance, very similar problem, not enough people anymore. No one wants to do the job and it's also dangerous. I mean, uh, if you're protecting and then a real estate, uh, so it's obviously there's people trying to enter. Uh, we know that and therefore having humans out of that environment is much more better. And if, if a robot breaks uh, because somebody dropped a stone in it, that's fine. It's just money for, for hardware. You, you don't have to, to injure or kill someone, right? So. There's a lot of those environments where we see we can add a lot of value with our technology. Um, also, looking further ahead, agriculture. I mean, same here. Also running out of humans. Uh, there's, uh, we, we all need to eat, so therefore we need to automate. And it's also an unstructured outdoor environment where we can add value. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, I think that's kind of getting towards the end of the, the window, but... Uh, it's been great getting to talk with you, Mark. I uh, really appreciate uh, learning about your perspective, your company, um, how you see things in the future. Um, is there anything kind of your your website or, or anything you kind of would, would want to leave viewers with um, for them to check out or to learn more about what you guys are doing um, or if they're interested in getting in contact with you? Sure. I mean, uh, first of all, go to our website. Uh, we have regular webinars. Uh, the next one comes up exactly about skills and AI. Uh, how to develop them and how to develop them on our platform and therefore bring them into robots, uh, how easy it is uh, to apply that. Um, and obviously follow us on social media, LinkedIn and uh, YouTube. We're not so good in dancing video with dancing robots, but we are good in application. <laughs> gotcha. Awesome. Well, thank you, Mark. It's been great talking. Thank you for taking the time, Kyle.